Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. We've made huge progress in the use of targeted therapies for ER positive breast cancer. It's, for me, a really exciting area. This is the most common subset of breast cancer in both early and late stage disease worldwide. And we, the advances we've made date back to knowing hormone therapy would work at all in the late 1800s, tamoxifen. And then, you know, we made a big advance with the use of the aromatase inhibitors. Most recently, we've seen the use of ovarian suppression and aromatase inhibitors combined studied in the SOFT and TEX trials, and you know, that data, I think, is quite striking in very young women. But we're still after the big hole. Hormone therapy doesn't work for everybody who has clearly hormone receptor positive disease, uh, and we've really been struggling about why that is. So you know, if you still have your receptor, why shouldn't blocking the receptor in one way or another, getting rid of the estrogen or blocking the receptor work? And you know, the recurrences in hormone receptor positive disease are late often, not always, but late. And that's also really frustrating because you've treated a patient, they say, Doc, am I cured? And we're like, I don't know, you know, we gotta wait a while. And although recurrence rates go down, clearly the farther out you get from diagnosis, it's not uncommon for us to see these eight, 10, and after 10 year recurrences in hormone receptor positive disease. So it's been a critical area and affects the majority of women with breast cancer. So now we understand a little bit more about the drivers of resistance, and we have targeted therapies that can help to uh, really make hormone therapy more effective. We don't know if we actually are so-called reversing resistance or whether or not we're improving response. It could be that the cancers that are most highly resistant may not be as well targeted with these new therapies, but that the, the, the cancers that are less responsive are. So, you know, it's targeting specific alterations in response. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of work going on in the laboratory, and I think we're gonna see an explosion of that data now in the future about what are the drivers of this resistance and in what tumors specific therapies work better so that we can better direct our treatment. So the big advances, we have the outside of HER2 positive hormone receptor positive disease. We now have the first approved drug, which was Everolimus, an mTOR inhibitor that showed a, a more than doubling of progression-free survival in patients who progressed on non aromatase inhibitors. So a group of patients where progression-free survival has been extremely short. So that, that was exciting. Now, tempered by toxicity of that agent, and the need to try and manage the toxicity. I think that we've largely gotten over the mouth sore issue with uh, so-called stomatitis uh, with using a steroid mouthwash that we're still actively studying. But there are other toxicities, clearly, that make the treatment more challenging than hormone therapy alone, although still effective. And then the newest class of drugs just approved in early 2015 in an accelerated fashion, waiting for additional data, is a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor, uh, palbociclib, blocking CDK4-6. And there are two additional CDK4-6 inhibitors that look quite promising that are in clinical trials. At ASCO 2015, we saw really exciting data about uh, palbociclib added to fulvestrant. And the reason why this is exciting is for two reasons. One is that uh, it, I think, validates what we uh, had from a 160 patient phase two trial that led to the accelerated approval, still waiting for the randomized phase three first line data that's the similar design. Maybe we'll see it in the next year, which will be exciting. Uh, but this, it validates it because it's in a higher risk group. It's in a group of patients who already have disease resistant to those non steroidal aromatase inhibitors. Uh, and the second reason why I think it's so interesting is these cancers are more resistant. And so clearly adding a CDK4-6 inhibitor can overcome resistance even farther down that sort of pathway of uh, aggressiveness uh, in breast cancer. And so 
That's great. Uh, the data from Paloma 3 showing again more than doubling of progression-free survival with no additional safety t uh, signals, really exciting, I think. The best data we've seen with fulvestrant in this pretreated population where about a third of the patients had received prior chemotherapy. All of the patients had to have disease progressing on a non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor. Uh, and the uh, neutropenia, which is a, a very common toxicity from the CDK4-6 inhibitors, doesn't seem to result in problems such as febrile neutropenia. No increased rate of febrile neutropenia no increased rate of infections, you know, problems such as that, and you can manage it fairly easily. So this is, I think, a, a very exciting time because once you start getting drugs that work, there's actually a lot more research poured into that area. And as we start understanding what uh, pathways and what proteins are upregulated, what changes when patients' cancers are either resistant up front or develop resistance to the CDK inhibitors, we'll be able to think about the next generation of drugs, which will help further to delay or uh, resistance or improve response to hormone therapy. Of course, you know, we use these markers now uh, to the, just as hormone receptor positive. That's all we need to add these drugs in. And then, of course, fitting the clinical trial parameters in order to use that data to treat our patients in practice. But really for all of us in oncology, the most exciting aspect of this data is the chance that we're going to cure more women with this most common form of breast cancer and move the drugs into the adjuvant and neoadjuvant settings. There's a large randomized adjuvant trial plan that's an international collaboration called the PALAS trial. And of course, we're looking forward to that trial starting this year. Uh, and, uh, you know, it'll take a while to get data. But uh, if you focus on a higher risk group of patients, that will help us a lot. Estrogen-positive breast cancer is the first type of breast cancer that actually took advantage of targeted therapies. This is a disease that has been treated with a targeted treatment for probably 100 years, since it was first discovered that if ovaries get suppressed, either by surgery or some other medications, some of these cancers may evolve precisely because they do depend on estrogen to continue to grow. Therefore, medications like tamoxifen, more recently aromatase inhibitors, and now uh, more evolved drugs such as selective estrogen receptor down regulators, uh, such as fulvestrin, have been incredibly helpful in successfully treating these cancers. In the last decade, we now are seeing newer targeted therapies against estrogen-positive breast cancer that are being used in conjunction with endocrine therapy. And that, again, has become a new tool to treat patients with metastatic disease. And some of these targeted therapies are now transitioning earlier on. To name a few, uh, inhibitors of the P3 kinase pathway, such as mTOR inhibitors, Everolimus, was the first targeted agent aside from endocrine therapy that was approved for the treatment of metastatic disease that is refractory to conventional therapies such as aromatase inhibitors. And now we're seeing medications such as CDK4-6 inhibitors, which also have shown very promising results in first and now, more recently, second line treatment of endocrine positive breast cancer. There are several new targeted therapies now that are very promising, particularly for certain types of breast cancer. I'm going to focus mostly on estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, in which newer drugs like P3 kinase pathway inhibitors and CDK4-6 inhibitors have come to play a much bigger role in the treatment of these cancers in the metastatic setting. CDK4-6 inhibitors are molecules that, as their name says, they block CDK4 and 6. These are part of the cycling D pathway. So therefore, they end up blocking cell cycling. And this is obviously important because in order for cancers to continue to grow, they need to cycle and, within, and, and divide and continue to proliferate and metastasize or not. And medications such as CDK4-6 inhibitors will, will precisely inhibit that. The other advantage of these medications is that they also interfere with the estrogen signaling. So therefore, there's a big synergy between CDK4-6 inhibition and endocrine therapy. And therefore, nowadays, we know that clinically, when you combine endocrine therapy with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, you end up seeing an, an impressive advantage in progression-free survival for patients in first line, and according to a fairly recent press release, also in second line in combination with fulvestrin.